At this time, I'm going to have Pastor Dahlquist come and give us our message, first Sunday of the month, first Sunday evening of the month, and I've been looking forward to what God has given him, what he's prepared for us. So, Brother Dahlquist, would you come and give us this message tonight? Thank you, Pastor. All right. And so it's good to see you all this evening, and so I hope that for those of you that are going and those of you that are considering on going, I hope you're excited about the hockey game that's coming up here this Friday. And so I just want to make a quick plug there myself. Uh, one of the things that they just recently notified us of is that it is teddy bear night, and uh, which means that uh, when we go there, the first uh, goal that the uh, Flint Firebirds score, the entire crowd is supposed to throw teddy bears onto the rink. And, uh, and so what you can imagine is it's going to be mass pandemonium. My kids are all excited. They're, they've already selected their teddy bears that are going to be sacrificed um, to this event. And, uh, and so, and I'm all excited about it too. I found the, anybody here ever own a teddy rock spin? And so anybody remember what a teddy rock spin is? And so I imagine, yeah, there we go, Adam's got it. And so does Pastor. And, and it was this big old, t- <laughs> you don't have one? <laughs> he listens to the stories every night. Um, <laughs> But it was this big old tape and it was it was pretty much filled with a tape recorder. Those old the old tape recorder memory you could record on them and you could play at the same time. So they pretty much put one of those inside a teddy bear. Those things are just heavy and bulky and they are if you ever got hit with one of those, my brother and I we hit each other with that, that thing every now and then, those things hurt. And uh, so I'm aiming for one of the Saginaw players that are going to be at the game uh, that night. No, I'm I'm not. And so for anybody watching online, no, I am not. I did not just confess to maliciously attacking a player from Saginaw. Um, (laughs) Bob is like, what did I just hear? No. Um, But uh, anyway, so if you're coming, please remember to bring that as well. Um, if you want to participate, all the teddy bears will be collected up and they'll be taken to St. Jude's to give to a child that is having a very rough Christmas this year. And, uh, and so and the players will be distributing those. And so they just asked for us to do that. And, uh, and so, of course, uh, if you want to participate in that, you can. But I just want to make sure everybody's available. I know if I had the opportunity to throw a teddy bear on an ice rink and someone didn't tell me about it beforehand, I'd be very upset when I got there. So, uh, so now, you know, now you know and you can use the information how you want to. If you have your Bible tonight, let's go ahead and turn to uh, Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. And so this is a, uh, if you could look at my Bible right now, you would literally see that the pages in my Bible around this, this portion of Scripture are just filled with notes. Um, and so and this has been a very uh, important book as well as a very important chapter in my life. And um, very, or pretty much... The, the feeling or the thought of tonight's message, and just kind of hold this in, your, in the back of your mind, is understanding where good decisions come from. So understanding where good decisions for our life, where do those come from? And how do we, how do we find or how do we make good decisions in our life? And the introduction to that is given right here in this first, the first seven verses of Proverbs chapter 1. So we're going to go ahead and read that right now. It says in verse 1, it says, The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding. To receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. To give subtlety to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. Uh, To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. Verse 7, and this is really kind of our key, key passage here in this beginning here. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Before we go any further, we're going to go ahead and open with a word of prayer in our message, and then uh, we'll get into the, dig, dig into the rest of this. Dear Lord, we just thank you again for this opportunity to be here today. God, I pray now that uh, you would just work in each of our lives. God, burn us about decisions that we make. Lord, the way we make them and, and who we allow to influence us in making those decisions. God, I pray now that uh, you would just help us to live lives that are honoring to you. Lives that would be a life that uh, when looking back on it, we can say, thank God for what God has done and for how God has worked in my life. I just pray these things now in Christ's name. Amen. When we look at this passage of Scripture, one of the things that we need to understand about the book of Proverbs 
is that the book of Proverbs is a book that addresses man's desires and the proper application of fulfilling those desires. Now, the desires that, that God has given us are clearly laid out and really kind of, it's interesting how God kind of just synopsizes these into pretty much three areas. And it begins in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 through 29. And so now I got this, I actually got this thought from another pastor, but in Genesis 1, verses 27 through 29, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. Oh, okay, so, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the, every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in which the which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed. To you shall it be for meat. So we see that there pretty much are three main desires that you can, and he said that you can pretty much break down every decision that we make, every desire that we really have, really falls into one of these three categories according to that pastor. And he made a pretty good argument about it. And so, but we look at, and we see that there really are, are we see that in a very general context, we can look at our lives and see that there are three main areas of desire or directives or primary desires that God has given us. And so first is to multiply. The second is to have dominion. Now, dominion simply just means to have, or have the power to rule over or to have control over something. And then sustenance. And so each of those three things, are you can look at our lives, and each of those in some ways, if you want to really be general, general you can say, okay, in those three areas, each decision I make in some way addresses one of those three areas. And so when I walked into my, my house today and I felt a slight chill, I wanted to have dominion over my environment. So what did I do? I went to the thermostat, I turned it up to 85 degrees. No, I did not. <laughs> my wife would kill me. But, and so and, and in many different areas, we look at the decisions we make. Many times, it addresses one of these three things. When I get hungry, I, walk over to the, I walked over to the refrigerator. I grabbed my family. We like to, at least my kids and I, we like to make pickled eggs. My wife forbids us to do this, but we do it anyways. And so we make pickled eggs. And so I was hungry today, so I went and grabbed a pickled egg. Then I walked over and kissed my wife right on the lips. <laughs> <laughs> and so that addresses substance. And so we see that God, in each of those three areas, decisions we make, and we can continue to go on, and I'm not going to belabor it, but we go on and look in each of those three areas to multiply, to have dominion and, and sustenance. We can see that in many ways, if you want to be very generalized, you can look at your life and say, okay, each decision I make usually addresses one of those three things in some greater context. So... We see that here are, how, but the question that we're going to be answering tonight, and the question that we're looking at, where, and really we have the introduction to finding those answers, is here. It says, How are we to seek to fulfill these desires? In this day, of, in day and age, in our lives that we live now, we have financial counselors, we have self appointed spiritual advisors, we have behavioral modification experts, family planners, political, or we have political correctness training, and we have a lot of voices competing over our decisions and the philosophies that govern our lives. In many cases, crimp. Christians, and we need to be careful of this, and myself included, in many cases, Christians simply resign themselves to following the world's direction and way of living without ever consulting God's word. Pretty much to say, well, you can't say this now, or you can't do that now, or it's impolite or inappropriate for you to do this anymore. It's not okay for you to walk up and try and tell somebody about Jesus Christ because you might offend them. We resigned ourselves simply to following the world's direction and guidance. But tonight we will look at, we will look at in this introduction portion of Proverbs, we will look at the answer to those questions. Where do, where should we look for guidance? How should we conduct our lives? And how should we pursue our God-given desires? 
So we see that here opening up right away in verse, now I'm going to combine verse 1 too, because verse 1 is really just kind of identifying who our author is. And so, and that's identifying that it's Solomon. It's saying, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. Now one of the things that we need to t- quickly just acknowledge th- about here is that in an earthly context, one of the wisest men, the wisest men that the Bible says was in the world was Solomon. But not only was he a very wise man, but also we see that he was influenced by, and there is mention made to his father, King David, who again was maybe not known as the wisest man, although he was a very wise man, but he was definitely known as a man who, ha- who was after God's own heart. So here we have the, the combined knowledge. We're learning from the son who is now the wisest man in the world, who had the father who taught him to have a spiritual love and admiration for God, who are telling us these are the things that God wants in our lives. And so we see the first thing here in verse 2 is this. To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding. Now, very plainly here, and some of this, I mean, I understand it seems somewhat elementary and maybe even a little bit, okay, like this is, this is kind of childish here that we're defining all these words here. But in going through this, I've read this portion of Scripture dozens of times. And so, but even in reading it, many times we read words and we don't stop to think, what does that word really mean? How is it that I actually apply this to my life? It's one thing for you to read your Bible every day. It's one thing for you to read your entire Bible in a year. But it's not simply to read it. It's to know it. Do you know God's word? You say, well, I go to church every Sunday. If you, come to, if you rely solely on the, the, the little bit that can be given in a Sunday morning, Sunday night, and a Wednesday service, you are going to be very limited in your understanding of God. You say, oh, you pastors must be horrible. No, there's only so much time that we have to give you as much as we can. And so if you really want to have a close relationship with God, if you honestly want God's direction in your life, it takes your effort. I cannot be, pastor cannot be, we cannot be the spiritual advisors for you that that help you dictate and direct your life. We will do our best to show you what God's word says and how how you are to conduct your life. But if you really want to know God's will for your life, if you really want to know what God's word says about a specific situation that you're going through, you need to spend the time yourself. You need to be spending time studying God's word. You need to know what God's word says about certain situations in your life. And so to know simply means this, to find out, huh? be acquainted with, be skillful in. So when it comes to studying God's word, are you acquainted with it? Are you skillful in the application of of God's word to to your life? Have you even taken the time to find out what God's word says about a particular situation in your life? Do you know God's word? But not only do we know God's word... But when we know God's word, when we, when we start to apply God's word to our lives, when we, when we actually investigate to find out what is it that God says about this situation that I'm going through right now, how is it that God can affect my life? The Bible says that if I do seek to know God's word, if I do study it out, then I can receive wisdom. Now that word wisdom, when we look at that, we look at it's somewhat of an of a earthly context, at least from what I understand from studying this portion of Scripture. And so the word wisdom used in this portion of Scripture literally means to be skillful in war, wise in administration, possessing good judgment, the ability to govern, to govern oneself in religious affairs, and wise ethically. And so it's talking about If we start to know God's word, if we apply God's word to our lives, it doesn't just apply to the church building. A lot of times, and this is a big push right now, we heard about it and Pastor mentioned, I don't remember when he did or not, but he mentioned a statement of of an unsafe person about separation of church and state. First off, that's a misquote of Jefferson. Jefferson was, was 
or was trying to console and trying to, to give assurance to the, Dan, oh, I believe it was Danbury Baptist, is that not correct, Pastor Lane? The Danbury, yeah, in New, in New England, trying to tell the Danbury Baptist, do not worry, the government will not be involved in your religious affairs. They were warning the Baptists because, believe it or not, the Baptists have been concerned for a long time about the government trying to reach into the church and tell us how we, how we can worship God. And so he, Jefferson was, con, was consoling them and saying, no, there will be a separation of church and state. The, church, or the state will keep its nose out of the church. It does not say anywhere in there that the church has no place in the government. There's a reason why Congress prays every time before they open a session of Congress. Congress. There's a reason why the Ten Commandments are written on the Supreme Court walls, although they try and cover it up by opening the door so I can't see it. There's a reason why God's word is literally engraved in the stone of almost every monument around the National Capital Region. It's because the church is supposed to be involved in our government. And a Christian that, that votes contrary to what God tells us to, is right, and a Christian that refuses to participate in our own government is a Christian that is, that is rightfully in, uh, is rightly out of sorts with God. We have a responsibility. The Bible tells us to obey the king. But in the nation of the United States of America, we, the people, are the king. And so we have a right to direct the affairs of our government. We have a right to demand accountability of our government officials. And so we have a responsibility to do that as Christians. So I'm telling you to be mean and hostile and say bad things. I hope not. Or I hope you don't do that. You shouldn't do that. That would be sin. But am I telling you that you have no, that you have no right to demand that your uh, representatives represent you? No, you are responsible for it. The same way that a king is responsible for ensuring that those that are responsible for him are obeying what he has sent them to do is the same thing that's true for, for those who are now the people and responsible, responsible for what the actions of our representatives do. Praise God for a justice system that has finally started to take steps against abortion. But it's not the justice system, or it's not the justice system's duty, sole duty to do that. It should have been legislators a long time ago should have been, been proposing laws protecting life. We have a responsibility. We must be involved. If we're not involved, we cannot complain about the state of affairs. God wants us to pray, yes, but then God expects us to be active. We must be active, both in getting the gospel out, but then also in, the in helping in the governing of our affairs as a nation. He gives us wisdom, and we see that wisdom deals with wor worldly wisdom, but then also he gives, it says, to know wisdom and instruction. Instruction means to be self-controlled, enforced obedience, to bring into conformity and to correct by punishment. You say, wow, what is, what is all that talking about? It says that when we, when we are, we ha or when we know God's word, then we will become instructed by God. When, the, when God moves and when God chastens or he corrects us, we will take that correction and we will apply it properly. When, the, when decisions are made and when things don't necessarily go the way that we want to, we will be self-controlled. When, when it comes to our living and when it comes to the way that we conduct our lives, we will bring our lives into conformity with God's word. But then we also see this. It says that, it, it, one, we know wisdom. Two, we know instruction so that we understand what God is, was, how God is dealing and directing with us and we'll be controlled in following those instructions. But then also he gives us understanding. Understanding is the ability to judge a situation 
subject, okay, so it's the ability to judge a situation, subject, or people's behavior. Understanding is being able to look at something and understand, and, or, and I, don't, I, hate, I hate using the same word in the definition, but to understand something means to look at something and to know why it is happening. I think a lot of, uh, of Andy Rieger in this regard. He can look at things mechanically. And so when I see, so I just see a jumbled mess just shooting, you know, bolts all over the place. <laughs> and so and he looks at it and he says, okay, the reason why this is happening is because this is out of whack. And he can show you where the grooves and where the wear marks are and different things. Why, understanding is understanding why something is happening. Now it doesn't just happen to be, it doesn't just have to apply to mechanical situations, but it can also be to general situations. Why, why did my, my daughter, why did Zoe get angry at me and you know, start crying and, and, and run off? Well, because I talked about an injury she recently had and, so, and it hurt her feelings. And so that's understanding. Why did it happen? Because I did something that wasn't right and I am sorry, Zoe. And so, but we see that understanding helps us to understand those things. And actually, now that I think about that, if I was a smart father, I would not have just brought it up in front of the entire church. <laughs> I'm sorry again, Zoe. You're as pink as your dress right now. And so, all right. But. So we see that God's word allows us to know or allows us to have or possess wisdom, instruction, and understanding. But then not only that, we see to receive, in verse 3 it says, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. So now we're looking at, okay, so now we receive additional instruction. By taking God's word, applying it to our lives, when we look at God's word, we can gain not only... Not only do we gain wisdom, instruction, and understanding, but now we also receive, we learn justice. You say, well, what is justice? Very plainly, the simplest definition I could come up with for justice was justice is what is right, normal, and rightly expected. When it comes to justice, those are, when we, when we are dealing with others, when, when others deal with us, we expect them to treat us right, we expect them to treat us as if we are a normal person, the same as everyone else, but then also it's rightly expected. We expect that I will be treated the same as everyone else and I'll receive a fair treatment as everyone else. That's justice. Judgment just simply makes making a correct decision. How is it that I can, how is it that I can know what is the right way to treat somebody? How is it that I can know what the what is rightly expected or what someone should rightly expect from me? How is it that I can make correct decisions in my life by applying God's word to it, by trying to apply it to my life? But not only that, we see that we can also receive equity. God's word, if applied in the situations that we deal with, we will deal with people in an equal situation. We will be fair, even, and free of favoritism. You want, to, you want to definitely have a constant check on whether or not you were, you were being equal or you were showing equity to people is go down and spend a few minutes in the teen class. And so I'm trying to be in front and, and pick a few people. I'll tell you right then, you will find out very quickly if you were being equitable or not. Why'd you pick him? Why'd you pick her? Why do you always pick him or her? Why can't you pick me? Because you didn't raise your hand. You know? So it, trust me, I get it a lot. But equity is making sure that you are fair, that you're even. And so in other words, you treat everybody the way that they're supposed to be, are evenly and fair. Uh, boy, again, using the same words over and over again. Sorry about that. But then, and it's in a way of, that is free of favoritism. And that is the way that we would like to be treated. That's the way we want to be treated. So how is it that then we can take that and apply that in our lives so that when we're dealing with other people, when we're dealing with customers, when we're dealing with our friends, when we're dealing with our family members, when we're dealing with our children, how is it that we can treat them in a way that is right, that is just, and that is, ju as, that is also in an uh, equity or equal or fair manner. But then also, the Bible says in verse 4, to give subtlety to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion. 
Salty very just simply means, and it's actually kind of, when I first read that word, and actually I even talked to my wife about it, I just asked her because it really, when I read the definition, it actually kind of surprised me a little bit. And uh, so I asked my wife, what did she think about it? And she, her definition was very close to mine, that when it came to subtlety, I thought it was being someone that was somewhat almost humble, submissive, uh, not really noticed in the background, uh, kind of like that shy kid that kind of gets passed over a lot. And so when I first read that, I was like, really? It gives you subtlety? But it says to give subtlety. Subtlety means this, clever, discerning awareness, and hard-headed in a way, and hard-headed in the way you think about or understand someone or something, especially in practical matters. Cunning in dealing, clever, adept in the use of skill or knowledge. It goes on. Or in attaining an end, the ability to govern and discipline oneself in a logical way. Good judgment in the use of resources, caution, and caution to danger or risk. And so that's what subtlety means. So if you meet a person that is subtle, and, okay, in and, and this context, okay, so I, uh, there are other modern, more modern uh, translations, or not translations, but uh, definitions of the word subtle, that means pretty much unnoticed. But in this case with subtlety, it's talking about God's word can give you what many would consider to be a clever, discerning awareness. And now that hard-headed is not meaning that you are irrational and that you that even when you're wrong, you don't accept it. What it's talking about is that when you know something is right, when you know something is the correct way of doing things, you don't let others steer you. It's almost a, it's a it's a moral attribute in the sense that if you know what you're what is right and what should be done, even at your own expense, you're willing to stand your ground and infor- and insist on what is right and fair. And so and you don't allow others to sway your way of thinking about or understanding a situation. Especially in, uh, again, in practical matters and dealing. And so, but it also talks about being skillful in the, the knowledge and application of just, you know, you ever met that guy that every way he looks at a problem, it's just like, he doesn't just look at it and say, oh, well, it's just, you know, like that. And then he kind of gets it right. It kind of, it, it makes it through, but it's not really right. But that guy that when he looks at a situation, his answer is one that just, it just completely almost blow, blows your mind. To like, wow, you took that and you turned it into this. It, um, and I'm sorry, I don't have a better example of what that could be right now. I tried to find it in, and put it in my notes. It didn't make it. I'm sorry, folks. But... But it's just that person that has that, just that wise understanding. It gives them subtlety. But not only subtlety, it gives subtlety to who, though? So it takes subtlety and it gives someone that wise discernment, that ability to avoid things that are dangerous, that person the ability to avoid possibly getting into the pitfalls of life. And who does it give it to? Well, it gives it to the person who is simple. And that word simple simply means someone that is naive, foolish, and open-minded. Now, today, open-minded is a very positive thing, especially if you look up definitions about open-minded. Just on the internet, resor- or internet resources, you'll find out that there is a very, that the world wants you to be very open-minded. And so in many contexts, being, there's nothing wrong with being open-minded. But in this context, open-minded is talking more of an immoral context. In this case, open-minded is talking, is talking about someone who is, is receptive to arguments against what is, what is moral or true. So being open to the point where you are willing, and that falls more underneath the naive uh, category here, is if you're open-minded to the point where you're willing to accept anything that anybody tells you, like being naive... The Bible says that that's someone that would be considered simple. That would be someone that the Bible declares as as being a simple person who is foolish. And so in the context that is being used here in this portion of Scripture, open-minded is not a good thing. Open-minded is someone that's willing to accept whatever, whether it be right, wrong, or any right or wrong. But then also we see it gives it gives subtlety to the simple and to the young man. Knowledge. That word knowledge just simply means perception, skill, discernment, understanding, and wisdom. 
And that word discernment means it gives him a purpose, discretion, and also allows him to, to develop a plot. Which, in, in since pretty much, and I still do this a lot today, but I remember especially as a young man, when I was in my, early teen, my late teens, early 20s, it didn't, thinking wasn't a high priority in a lot of the things I did. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and so I got myself into a lot of trouble. And I'm not necessarily talking about moral or anything like that. But many of you have heard, have heard the, the dynamite story that I've told about where I got blown up. And uh, not literally blown apart, but I, we had a stick of dynamite that went off very close to me, close to my head, and somehow I lived. <laughs> You're like, yeah. Bob, Bob was like, so that's what's wrong with him. Um, and so, and a lot of other things, you know, you know um, get, yeah, anyways, a lot of other things that, now again, we're not sinful, we're not immoral or anything like that, but just some dumb things I did as, as, a, as a young man, and it says that if I had just taken time to plot it out, if I had just taken time to think about what I was about to do, I probably would have saved myself a lot of, a lot of physical pain. Um, and save myself a lot of a lot of other uh, negative re- or negative uh, reactions because of the things I did. And so, to the young man, it says, if you're willing to take God's word and apply it to your life, it can help you plot a course in your life where you can avoid those pitfalls. You can avoid the the destructive decisions that you may come in contact with. And not necessarily. Again, I would. I, in many contexts, yes, it's sinful. And sin is a destructive force. It will ruin your life. But also, it can just help you make wise decisions in the things you do, how you use the resources God has given you. And, so, and God can use that so that you can make a wise course in your life and can be happy with the outcomes at the end. And it gives you a purpose as well. That was one thing I found myself needing so strongly. When I, when I graduated high school, I needed a purpose for my life. My life could not, I had grown up my whole life learning that the reason that although we lived in a free society, that there was an expectation of service that was in our life and gave me a purpose for my life. And that I needed to pursue that. And first in the service of my country, but then later I understood that the desire that God had given me to serve was not just to serve a country that will one that may one day dissolve, but to serve an eternal kingdom, to serve an eternal God that had that that has a great desire for my life and for the lives of every human being, and that is first to get saved. And so I found out that I had a greater purpose. So where do we find that purpose? We can find that in God's Word. And so we see that God gives these things if we're willing to study his word. But the caveat here is that when we take God's word and when we, when we do start to read it, much like in James where it talks about a man looking in his glass and immediately he looks, at the, looks in a glass or looks in a mirror and then immediately goes away, the same thing is true here. It says in verse 5, it says, A wise man will hear... And will increase in learning. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. And to apply a proverb and interpretation. The words of the wise and and their dark sayings. You say, what does that all mean? It's telling us that if we're wise. When we read God's word. When we go looking for those answers to those questions in our lives. Our response, if we are wise. Will not be simply to be. Oh, you know, well, I'm glad I read that. Now I can go and do what I want to. Or it won't be, this is an old book. It doesn't apply. Somehow, even though God is the most intelligent being that ever existed and he knows every aspect of my life, he doesn't understand this situation so I don't have to, he didn't prepare for it in the Bible so I don't have to listen to it. No, that's a simple person. That's a naive person. The truth is, is that God knows exactly what you're going through. God knows exactly what the answer is to every situation in your life. And so, and a wise person looks at the Bible and says, okay, if God says this is what I should do in this particular situation, then this 
is what I need to do. You say, well, what are those the situations dealing with? Again, going back to the very beginning of our, our message tonight, it's probably dealing in three main areas, either to multiply, to have dominion over something, or for our nourishment or for our consumption. And so what, what is it that I should be doing in those areas? Well, then the Bible says a wise man will take God's word and apply it to his heart and apply it to his life. And in that very last portion, this is where we're going to close. I'm almost done. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. That word fear there is very important. When we see that a wise person will take God's word and not just read it and then cast it aside, a wise person will read God's word and say, okay, this is what God's saying. This is what I should do. And fear means not that I'm terrified of God. Many people want to look at God as if he is this dictator that sits up, sits up in heaven and that if we don't behave, he, throw light, he throws lightning bolts down at us. That is not the God of the Bible. The God of the, Bible's, God of the Bible wants us to fear him, but that fear does not mean that we're terrified of him. That fear means this, to respect or understand that something is important and should be treated in an appropriate way. When we fear God, it means that when we look at his word and the things he tells us to do, we don't say, oh, that's not that important for me to listen to. Oh, I can do these other things. Oh, I need to listen to this person because they seem successful in one, one very small particular area of their life. And so because they're, they're successful in this one particularly small area, I'm going to follow them because I think that they're the right person to follow. Bible says that the fear of the Lord will help us to respect and understand that what God is saying is important. Amen. And not just some of it, but all of it. I can become the richest man in the world, but if I lose my children, or if I lose my wife, what am I really? Nothing. I can focus and spoil my children and give them everything that they ever desired, but if they grow up never learning to rely on God, if they, learn, or never, if they grow up never learning to supply or provide for themselves, what have I done as a father? I can tell my wife I love her every day, but if I never show it to her, will she really believe me? The Bible, says, the Bible teaches us how to address every situation in our life. And if we're willing to, if we are willing and wise enough to listen to it and to take it and try and understand what it's telling us to do, but then we respect God enough that we are willing to weight his sayings and, and give them some importance and to treat them in an appropriate way, then it says that we, we will start to gain knowledge. We can apply that knowledge to our lives. But... For the person that says, you know what? No, I want to listen to my guidance counselor at school. No, I want to go ahead and listen to all my friends. Or no, I'm going to, rather than, than doing what the Bible says, I'm going to go call my mom and let her tell me what I'm supposed to do. And we'll get into the parents. Verse 8, I already went over with this with our teens this morning. Verse 8 tells you to listen to your parents. But there are a lot of people that are using others as a reason for doing what is wrong and trying to justify their wrong actions, saying, well, they said it was a good idea when they never even took the moment to consult God's word and or they directly defy God's word because now they weight somebody else's opinion above God. They give God, them more importance and they treat them in a more appropriate way than they treat God's word or treat God. It says that fools, who is a fool? Fool is one who is mocks, even when guilty. Oh, I know I shouldn't have done that. Oh, you caught me. Oh, I'll put it back now that you caught me. That's a fool. Who is quarrelsome. No matter what, if they're wrong, Tyler, where are you at? If they're wrong, they insist they're right. <laughs> Lagging legal or moral constraints. If that's not... Go to California right now, they can legally loot and steal anything. It's steal you blind right now and not even be arrested. Legal, lacking legal or moral restraints. Disregard for rules of correctness. That's a fool. And what does a fool do? 
they dislike very much God. They dislike God very much. They disrespect God. They insult God. They have an extremely low opinion of God. And they have no value of God. That is a fool. And that is what, how they despise God. The question tonight, and as we get ready to close and the musicians get ready to come here. Where do you look for guidance in your life? Who do you listen to and follow regarding the conduct of your life? How do you pursue your God-given desires? They're given to you by God, but there's a right way to pursue them and there's a wrong way to pursue them. How do you pursue the God-given desires in your heart? When God looks at your life, or if others, if we could all be, if we all had the ability to look inside and honestly see your heart and the decisions that you make in your life, will we see someone with God and those around us? Will they see someone that respects and reveres God, or will they see someone who li- and someone who lives piously, or would they see someone that by their by our living and by the decisions that we make dislikes God, that is disrespectful to God, insults and shows no value in God and has no value for the word of God at all. You say, well, if you look at my life, you wouldn't, you know, I'm not really that bad of a person. All right, well then just look in one particular area. Maybe there's some area in your life where that applies to you, where you know what God has said, you know what God has told you to do, But you choose to despise God anyways. Well, you know, I go to church and I read my Bible sometimes and I try to be good. I put money in the plate. I do these things, you know, the religious things. So I'm okay with God. Yeah, but there's an area in your life where when you know what God says you're supposed to do, you're like, nah, I'm not going to do that. I have better things to do. That's despising God. It doesn't have to be your whole life, but there could be a part of your life where you despise God because you want to do what you want to do. If that's you tonight, then I pray that when we have the opportunity just to pray and while the music plays, just take that time to pray and get things right with God. Ask God for forgiveness. With everybody's heads bowed and everybody's eyes closed, maybe you sit here tonight and you say, There's something I need to get right in my life. If that's you tonight, if there's some area that you have been holding back from God, maybe it's some little thing that you just let creep in over time. Maybe it's something, maybe it's an attitude. Maybe maybe it's just a, a, a feeling of resentment. Maybe it's a, an action that you know or a thought that you know that you shouldn't allow to dwell in your mind. Whatever it is, ask God for forgiveness for it tonight. But if you sit here tonight and you've never asked Jesus Christ for your, to save you from your sins, if you don't know that 100% for sure that when you die that you are going to go to heaven, don't leave here tonight without letting somebody show you from the Bible how you can know that you're going to heaven. The Bible tells us that we can know for sure. The Bible tells us that we can have that assurance of salvation. It would be a horrible thing for someone to get their life as clean as they possibly can, only to die and spend an eternity separated from God, paying for your sins, when God already freely paid for it for you on the cross. All you have to do is accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. If that's you tonight, or if that's you online, and you need to get that cell tonight, I pray that you'll pray and ask Jesus Christ to save you. Or talk to somebody here and let us show you from the Bible how you can know that you're saved.